Hallelujah. All right, as we come to the close of this convention, I, as our custom is, we usually have a last session charge. And I, initially we do it with the last, with the morning session, but somehow this year, we just decided to make it different. Um, so that you get the import of this. I remember Miles Monroe, Dr. Miles Monroe, the one who brought it, the one, I listened to him in 1992, December precisely, and he said something that got my attention. He said, if you go for a convention of believers, you don't live with a nice time. And you know, I, I was used to a nice time. He said, if you go for a meeting of believers, you must live with a mandate. There must be something to be done after. Dr. Miles Monroe said that, 1992, a Sousa revival meeting. I said, well, well, that's quite an instruction. So from that point, uh, the conventions and meetings we've been organizing, different ministries that are presided over, I've always asked myself, what will people leave this convention with to do? Uh, rather than just have a great time and say we had a nice time flowing with the Holy Ghost, Bodies were healed, thank God. How many of you were healed last night? Raise your hand, come on. Raise your hand, come on. Heal. Raise your hand, praise God. Amen, amen. Stand up if you were healed last night. Praise God, hallelujah. Praise God. Come on, give Jesus glory, glory to Jesus. Hallelujah, amen. So sit down, that's good. Jesus is the healer. But you see, that's not a mandate. You rejoice in the Holy Ghost. That's not a mandate. You gave a word of knowledge. How many of you in your believers meetings, you gave words of knowledge? Raise your hand. Oh, very good. Now, a word of knowledge is not a define somebody with instruction. It means you give an information that you didn't know before about someone. Raise your hand. Very fine. Raise it well. Okay. In the meetings, you did that. Okay. And then, how many of you... Um, ministered to the sick in your believers meeting. You laid hands on the sick. Raise your hand. Very fine. So that's beautiful. But you see, that's not till a mandate. A mandate is what am I now going to do? Every time, when, when I attend conferences, and, and the one I attend the most, the most frequently, is the one by the Kenneth Hagin Ministries, uh, which is the Winter Bible Seminar. And I usually will ask myself at the last day, so therefore, so therefore, and it's not possible for me to go to any meeting and come back and the local church I pastor will not feel it. They will know. They have to know. So when you go to a meeting like that, any meeting that you go, not to minister, and I must say this too, uh, for many of us who are here, you're from different ministries and churches, thank God we appreciate your coming a lot and we really do. Can we please appreciate all the different pastors who are here from different churches. Some travel down to this country for that purpose and we're grateful. Now I want to say something and this is just from observation. Uh, many times people attend meetings at the early stages of their lives and ministries and then as soon as their ministries start to grow and then they become popular then they stop attending those meetings. So it appears like they only attended the meetings till they got popular. I think that's a wrong idea. That's a wrong mindset. It's a wrong mindset. Except if the Lord doesn't want you to go. But if it's a meeting where you get blessed and you're taught and you know it has had an impact in your life, I always say this, don't fix what is not broken. Don't abandon what works. Do you get it? If there are meetings that have been working for you, don't abandon them. Don't abandon what works for you. Praise the Lord. I told you in the morning, there's some things I always do. I'll always do it. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a custom. I always do. For over 20, 20, 23 years of my life of ministry, I always would listen to Kenneth Hagin when we have any special meeting. It's just the norm. You can't find me at that period. It's what works. I always will. Been doing it when our fellowship was 10, 20. It doesn't change anything. 
Anytime we're having special meetings for all those years, I, most of the time, not all the time, I will take a fast. Not because of any reason, but because that's what I've been doing for years. So you don't outgrow the basics. Don't outgrow the basics. If there are meetings that change your life. There are some folks, for example, who attend our meetings, World Changers Conference, and somehow, some people from somewhere decided to dissuade their mind that what are you going to do there? Or can you, can you just be praying like me and you go to a place that does not have air conditioner? And they got their minds to be corrupted. That shows you have no conviction. You see, if you're a man of conviction, nobody can talk you out of it. If you're a man of, you must be a person of conviction. Be a man of conviction. A person that knows what he's doing. I am ready to be the only one to face a crowd as long as I'm convinced. I don't take popularity contests before I do anything. Not in this life. And I got that from the Lord Jesus Christ. You must know when you are, con I'm not saying that you should be rebellious and say, I'm a man of conviction. That's not what I'm saying. But this is the word of God. Okay? And the only reason why you are being opposed is because it's not popular. Not because it's not the word of God. When I make friends, and I make friends, I remember my first time of meeting with Dr. Damina, who today is arguably my closest associate today, a senior one in the ministry. And we met, and I said to him, sir, he said, Pastor Chris, I want you to come to our church. I said, sir, don't worry. He said, no, I want you to come. I said, sir, if I come to your church, I will say what I want to say. He said, I don't have a problem. I know you now. That was the first time I've meeting him. He said, I know you have, have observed you. I know you say what you want to say. I said, I don't want reservations. When I get on the pulpit, I know they look face. He said, I know you. He said, my church will stand for truth. In fact, he said something one day that changed my own thinking. He said, when you go on the pulpit, preach what you believe. He said, no pastor should guard anyone not to say what he believes. He said, if the guy is wrong, it is the pastor's duty to come on that pulpit and correct what he has said. Christianity is not politics. Where you say what people want to hear. I love that about Dr. Damina. I call him a machine gun. He will blow. He will say what he wants to say. If you like, get angry. When you finish getting angry, you will hear him again. <laughs> I'm still learning that, I hope. <laughs> so that's the truth. You must live by conviction. Not that you will not travel to one country. You stay there for three months. Then you're already thinking, it's not even, everything is not about prayer now. It is not about speaking in tongues. What is wrong with you? Three months. Three months. A dear friend of mine said this. He said, those who peddle error seem to know how to stay with it. But those who maybe get embraced, they embrace the truth. Start looking for excuses not to say it that way. Have you seen that those who pay the are very bold? They will say that don't give a hoot about what you think. And those who have the truth say, eh, I'm not saying that it's wrong, go. I'm just saying that somehow the Bible says, I better go and sit down somewhere. Say what you want to say. Praise the Lord. Don't, don't abuse anybody. Don't insult anybody. Don't be rude to anybody. But also don't be rude to Jesus. Say his truth well. Say it clearly. Hallelujah. Years ago, I ministered in the Methodist church. Whether the, uh, is it the bishop? I don't know. No, it was the bishop. The reverend did not believe in speaking in tongues. He had spoken against it and all that. So the person who invited me said, and my friend, he said, you know, the man doesn't really believe. Maybe we should. I said, no, that's what I'm going to preach about. 1996. Or seven or so, nine, six. I said, that is what I'm going to preach. He said, ah, sir, sir. I said, he will either take the truth or hate the truth. And he gave me three sessions, two on a Saturday and one on a Friday. When I was done teaching on tongues, I can teach on tongues in my dreams. When I was done teaching it, 
The man said just one thing. He said, well, this is what people ought to know before they start speaking in tongues anyhow. I didn't care. <laughs> because when I was done, and the guy said, ah, even my reverend, he didn't have a problem with you. I said, I didn't have a problem with him too. And so, no, see, I tell people, if somebody is saying the truth and you fight him, if you don't hear him, others will. And those who hear it will now teach you. That's how it always happens. If you fight the person, those who hear it will now be the ones to teach you. Praise the Lord. Because the truth can never be overcome. No matter what it is. Be a person of conviction. If you are convinced that the New Testament ministry to be run in a particular way, if you are the only one doing it that way, stay there. Later on, you see, people that are fickle-minded don't influence anybody. Stay there. When you are consistent enough, it will change people's lives. Stay there. You believe prayer is the bedrock of New Testament ministry? Be prayerful. Let it be loud that your ministry is a ministry of prayer. You believe evangelism should take place in churches, through churches, and not doing programs and programs that have no bearing. Stay with it. Stay with it. In our ministry, you can ask our leaders are here. We do not cross-check with what other ministries are doing to know what we should do. No. We don't do things like that. We don't. What is in the word? We do it. What's making that church grow numerically? I don't want to know. Because if I know, ah, I don't want to know. But what is in the word of God? Let's keep doing it. Whatever it brings for us, it will glorify God. Stay with it. Be a person of conviction. A person of conviction. Hallelujah. Be a person of conviction. You are convinced. The Lord wants you to go to one nation and some nations to take the gospel there. Go there. Don't let someone attract you to America. Be a person of conviction. And stay with it. Hallelujah. The life of truth is in its consistency. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Remember in the morning, we said three things you must be aware of. What is it again? Lightness, looseness, and loquaciousness. To be light. You're just light. Have you been to some church services and the old place is just light? Just light. That if, how you know is that in the midst of those activities, if somebody quotes a scripture, it's like he farted. Have you seen that kind of meeting before? That when you now quote a scripture, you say, like, ah, what's going on? Why is scripture now? Why is scripture? Like, why is scripture? That kind of thing. Then you're not there to speak in tongues. They say, oh, these people have come again. We were enjoying our service voice with all these pretty people. That's lightness. There was a, some guys who went for a Christian meeting. Sorry, sorry for a Christian, um, what do you call it now? The engagement ceremony in Ibadan in 1997, I think. And my friend were there for that engagement ceremony. So they came to sing. So they had started singing church songs. Everybody was enjoying because the person was a church leader. Here's songs, everybody was dancing and church songs. Then they, they now left the temple. They left the temple and they left it high. So, you know, at that point that people were now dancing without caution. They were dancing. And you know, by the time you see sisters now turn around and begin to shake. You know what I'm talking about? Trouble has started. In the church. And they turned around like this and they began to, ah. And the whole thing was going in the church. Church. And everybody was there. So they had sang and sang. Everybody was, they had crossed over. So the guy who was the, behind, the, who was playing the music, actually was a Christian and non-Christian. So as he sang to a level, everybody was gone. He just said, 
Baby, me show color. Do you know what happened? They just flowed. Because, you know, they've already crossed the line. They just, forget it, baby. That's lightness. You see people bring comedy to the service and then they are joking about prayer. Sometimes they are joking about lewd things in the service. They are joking about tongues. They mock tongues. They mock casting out of devil. People just say, <laughs> I want to talk about when they see believers come in, people laughing and rejoicing the Holy Ghost. Say, What's all this nonsense? Yet they are laughing at jokes. The joke is on them. <laughs> See, and the man of God said, wait in there, wait in there. They have crossed over. Lightness. Then looseness. You are loose. That's irreverence. You don't know how to address dignities in the church. You don't know how to, you want to refer to a Christian meeting. You will say, um, we just came there, you know, that thing, you know, and you just talk loosely. Looseness. You're, 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 you're light, you're loose. Then you're loquacious. You don't know when to stop talking. It's not everything you should respond to. It's not every discussion you should say something. You must observe sanity. Come, 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 come and sit here. Pastor Swami, come and sit here. Are you running away from me? Because you came late. I'm harassing you. Deliberately. I got a hold of you. Oh, Nila. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, lose. You're just lose. Then you talk anyhow. Talk anyhow. All those things we said in the morning, they cause the move of the spirit to wane. Now, Remember, I told you, clapping is not praise. It's not worship. You can clap like a beat, right? Clap, you know, the way we drum. You can use your hand instead of the drum. But when you now have the drum, that's double portion of anointing. All right? In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, what is said to do with the hands is to lift your hands. You see, Singing in the church is different from entertainment. In entertainment, I dance a lot in entertainment. I dance a lot in entertainment. I do. Praise God. Oh, yeah. Entertainment. Just, yo, that's all. But you see, when it comes to the praise of God, which is a part of our worship of God, we must do it according to the faith. Put those things. See, don't care. What thing, people think you are looking like? Ah, that place, that place, the yo, yo, spirit conco, spirit conco, spirit conco. In those days, when you say spirit conco, I say canal conco. Yeah. <laughs> I return to Zenda. <laughs> say spirit, spirit, I say canal, canal. <laughs> it's the truth. Because the opposite of spiritual is being canal. That's all there is to it. Be firm with your conviction. If this is how the New Testament church should be, stay there. Don't be persuaded by what is going on around. I'm the least, I'm not boasting, no, but if I boast in Christ, I boast in Christ. I have, nothing moves me. Somebody was telling me, sir, uh, this and this and this. Uh, and I said, don't defend me. Don't waste your time. I can't even defend myself. Just preach the word. You preach the word. Be like, the, be like someone conducting an orchestra. Back the crowd. Face your walk. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. See, don't you see what we are doing? We are pushing our books every time. You think we have time for side talks? Hallelujah. If you get a hold of those books, what do you see there? It's Pauline. Very Pauline. Pauline. It doesn't come by downloading from Google. Amen. So, don't have time for, you know, I've got too much rank for side talks. Keep your eyes on the ball. Hallelujah. Keep your eyes on the ball. There's a master who has sent you on a mission. Face that. That's important. Lightness, looseness, loquaciousness. Take it away from your life. I said it. Even in your life, 
measure the kind of entertainment that you get involved in. Hallelujah. Stay with the leading of the Spirit of God as a pastor, as a minister. There's a leading. Hear me well. When there is already a leading, don't pray for another one. You are looking for confusion. Many of us, we already know the leading of the Spirit of God. Then we say we are praying because your mind wants you to do something else. Then you claim to want to fast. You are fasting deliberately to mislead yourself. When they, I remember reading a book by uh, uh, Pastor Roy Hicks, he used to be Brother Higgins, one of Brother Higgins' friends. He said something. It was in the book, The Myth of Unanswered Prayers. That was the title. That's why I thought that. The Myth of Unanswered Prayers. He said that when you have light and you are looking for light, you will get darkness. When you already know the light and then you are trying to find out what the light is, it is darkness that you are going to get. He said, however, if you want more light, he said, you will stay in that same light and more light will come. Who's following what I'm saying this afternoon? So, whatever you know is the will of God, do that one first. Don't try to be, okay, uh, and sometimes we are in the social media era where you put on Instagram, some churches will bombard you with pictures, even of their toilet. And the kind of cars that come to their church. And you know that it's only Uber that comes to your own church and taxify. As you keep reading those kind of things, you only just get to church. Our levels must change. Our levels must change. This is we are more than this. You are in trouble, though. And we're in that era. We're in that era. Sometimes I've been in meetings before, and I saw the picture of that meeting. I said, ah, ah, this same meeting is not this fine now. Someone said, Pastor, it's not everything you say now. Ah. <laughs> I said, ah, that meeting does not look this. I was there. I said, ah, they treat it, they treat it, they treat it. Church too, we treat it. Okay, it's good. Amen. Because I was, I was like, ah, this is not the program I attended though. <laughs> they said, oh, ah. That's not how it's done. Amen. Have you seen people that you will see them on the internet and they look very beautiful? <laughs> when you see them in real life, you want to hear arise, kill, and eat. <laughs> what I have cleansed, don't call on common. <laughs> Don't let that dominate your ministry. Amen. Some people now, every church service, they post picture. How people are entering the church. What am I, what? How people are coming inside. What's that for? Is it a bank? Or a tree? You see, when it comes to ephemerals, pictures, use it in a measured way. Pictures is not the proof of your ministry. Use it, okay? But in a measured way. Measured way. Don't bring in worldliness into your meetings because you want to measure up. You will lose something vital. I remember Brother Tokes told me where he, the place he ministered one time. He said, I said, he said, you know the atmosphere there? I said, how? He said, it's like when you want to take pictures, how you pretend. I can never forget that. He said, it was not a real Holy Ghost. Because when everything is doctored, 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 even the Holy Ghost will be doctored. Go for the real one. The one that is birthed in a place of prayer. In the things of the Spirit. By commitment and doggedness. Slow and steady, but you will get there. Slow and steady, you will reach the world. Slow and steady, you will reach the nations. Don't compromise the gospel because you want to reach people. If you can compromise the gospel, it's not people you want to reach. It's crowd you want to have. Stay with the gospel. Stay with the word of God. Hallelujah. Kenneth he again told us a story. How there was a time for about 10 years in America. He was the only one saying what he was saying. The only one. That's how a man of conviction is. 
Doesn't matter who is clapping for you. Doesn't matter. It matters whether the Lord endorses what you are doing. How do you know it? By his word. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? So as you leave this convention, set your face like a phoenix. The word and the Holy Ghost. The word and the Holy Ghost. The word and the Holy Ghost. That's all. Set your face like a flint. Praise the Lord. Let your ministry be the work of the Spirit. So I leave you with these words. Before I get there, I said, if you have a leading of the Spirit already, don't seek for any other thing again. You're looking for trouble. Amen. There's this song, show, um, you lead our follow. Where is it? You lead, I will follow the Spirit, and I hear you lead, I will follow to the end of time. Let's sing it over. You lead. You, you lead, and, and I will follow. You speak, and I hear. You lead, and I will follow to the end. Oh. Sing it three more times. Sing you lead. You lead. And I will follow. You speak. And I hear. You lead. You lead. And I will follow. To the end. Say it two more times. Sing, you lead, you lead, and I will follow. You speak, and I hear. You lead, you lead, and I will follow to the end. Uh, For the last time, everybody sing it. You lead, you lead, and I will follow. You speak, you speak, and I hear, and I hear. You lead, you lead, and I will follow. To the end of time. Amen. As we close this convention, I give you a charge. Stay in the fight. Hallelujah. Stay in the fight. A man who gives up easily cannot obey God. A man or woman... <laughs> I'm changing, I'm getting better, right? <laughs> a man or a woman, I guess my friend is watching me and say, well, you're getting better now. <laughs> a man or woman who gives up easily will not obey God. Because obeying God has a fight to it. Now, Jesus talks about loving your enemies. Matthew's Gospel 5, 44 and 45. Love your enemies. He speaks about that. Love those who hate you and all that. He talks about turning your cheek when you are slapped, for example. Human uh, enemies. But then later on, if you observe Jesus in the parable of the sower, this parable afterwards, sorry, in Matthew 25, 13, sorry, 25 and 26, he talks about an enemy. Who comes to sow tears. Which means that whenever the gospel is growing or the word of God is growing, there will be an adversary. 
In that instance, I showed you that it will be to plant something that is a fake around you. So the enemy works by opposition. He also works by duplicating what you're doing in a very counterfeit fashion. Now, I remember someone said something that, you know, bless my heart, and I, I, just to say this. You know, it was in one of my arguments about the charismatic ministry. He shot me down in a very, very peculiar way. I said, well, for every counterfeit, there must be an original. He said, that's not true. I said, yeah, he said, it's not true. He said, there's no original for Astra Travel. I said, it's true. He said, there's no, he mentioned many, Aoja Board, Magic. He said, there's no original for it. It's in itself evil. Because I said, no, the devil will only create something. I said, he said, no, the devil can give you something new. So I shut down that argument. <laughs> There can be a counterfeit that has no original anywhere. Is that very clear? <laughs> I just had to say that. So, therefore, Jesus said the, the enemy will sow tears. That's not an enemy you love. In Matthew 22, quoting from, from Psalm 110, verse 1, he says, He will, he will, he will, he will, he will he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on, your, on my right hand till I make your enemies, watch it, your footstool. Matthew 22, verse 42. Your enemy is your footstool in 44. So there are things that are opponents to the gospel. You don't love them. There are events, instances that are enemies to the gospel. What you do is that you fight it. So when it says love your enemy, always know the context which he said that. When it comes to the enemies of the word, and of the gospel, not personal ones. He says you fight them. And he states some of them. We're going to see that in a moment. For example, Paul in Ephesians 6 and 10. He said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Then in verse 12, he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle. He says we wrestle. So there's a wrestling going on. You can't obey God passively. You must obey God actively. So I say actively. You are deliberate about it. And this obedience has a fight to it. Watch this. In Matthew 16, okay, so there are enemies, there are things that will oppose your obeying God. There are things that will oppose your, your yielding to God in ministry. That's why I laugh when people get ordained to ministry and they are doing party. I'm wondering, party for what? I remember when I was uh, ordained uh, some years ago, 24 years actually, and uh, we left that place fasting. I, I mean, that was the spirit. We left the place fasting. And everybody was going, wow, there's more work to do. I remember we had to draw the map of Africa and we said, we're going to read one third of Africa in three years. <laughs> you know, but we were praying in the front of uh, Lagos University Christian Fellowship, uh, the uh, secretary. We're praying and fasting. Why? Because the work of the ministry demands soberness. It demands a whole lot of soberness. Not pictures. Not suits. Or jackets. Or hairdo. So Jesus, having said that, now turns to his disciples. Matthew 16. And verse 6. He says, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He uses two words in there. Take heed and beware. One of them is called Prosecco. P-R-O-S-E-C-H-O. P-R-O-S-E-C-H-O. It means attend to it. So say attend to it. Something you have to attend to. So you don't Get passive about it. He says, attend to the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He says, beware of it. Two things. Attend to it and look at it very well and be conscious. Which means that it can affect your ministry in a subtle way. And what usually is the enemy of our, our ministries, of the ministry of the gospel, are subtle things. So he says, attend to it. Be aware of it. 
Look at it well. Attend to it. Or else, things will happen that you were careless about. Remember, we're talking about staying in the fight. In Luke 12, he's still talking to his own disciples, turning there. In verse 12, he now turns to them in Luke 12. Unto them in verse 15, take heed and beware. Now, the first thing, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Let me explain to you. The Pharisees had very horrible interpretation of scriptures. And they had followership. You know, they drove a whole city to oppose Jesus and have him crucified. That's influence. They drove a whole city. I mean, they made people that were healed in Jesus' meetings to say crucify him. That's influence. So, people having influence doesn't mean it's of God. It doesn't also mean it's not of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, he says, take heed of their level. Now, in verse 12 and 13 of Matthew 6, he says, he was talking about their doctrine. The way they preach. And one of the traits of their doctrine, Jesus says, is covetousness. The one to have. It seems like many of us think that the Pharisees were just legalists. No. They were not just legalists. They were materialistic people. Anywhere you find legalism, most of the time you find materialism. They are twins. They work together. And the most subtle is materialism. Because unlike legalism, legalism is about do's and don'ts. Naturally, most of us don't like do's and don'ts. So we can easily break legalism. But when it comes to natural materialism, that's what you want. So it becomes subtle. It may become something that you may not be able to deal with. So Jesus says here, beware. Let's take verse 15 together. Let's go. Beware. Luke 12, 15. Are you there? Let's go. He said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. He's talking to his own apostles. Beware of it. And in this instance, he's talking about your own desire to have. The desire to have is human. Yet he says, take heed. That that desire doesn't control you. You start to measure who you are by what you drive. By the countries you can enter. By the number of visas on your passport. Then covetousness has entered. You start to measure how you relate. And who you relate with. By the kind of cars they drive. And where they live. He says take heed. Take heed. Take heed. Someone said one time, he said, ah, don't you know that the big boys in ministry, they stay in VI, they stay in, uh, if you want to blow in ministry, you have to move your house to VI. Nonsense. That person is sold out. That's nonsense. The world can talk like that, but not the church. Take it. That your heart is not overtaken by that desire. Is it wrong to stay in those good places? No, not at all. If you work for a living, you have your money, whatever you can afford, buy it. It's fine. But when it now becomes your measurement, you start to value yourself. So when people that don't have up to you talk to you and you respond to them in, rough, in a rough way, what do you do? do, I do? Some people, the reason why they treat other ministers in a low way, they look at the number in their church. They look at what car did he bring. I used to tell you, now, in ministry, I bought different kind of cars. Not before doing ministry, I bought different kind of cars. I've seen how people respond per car. I'm not joking, though. I don't want to mention the cars. From the fairly used to the very brand new, I knew how people were blessed before I preached. And that scared me. That means I can misrepresent the gospel. By even what I own. That's why when you see a preacher mention his cars and houses in the sermon, he's about to infect you with something. 
I love what Dr. Damina says. Why are you telling me about your house? Do we own it together? Tell me the one that concerns us in Christ. What's my own with the kind of phone you use, where you live? Do we stay there? And that's just the truth. Beware. Beware that your test, you know, when I was younger in ministry, I used to take Marawa, but, well, we thank God. I'm not boasting, but I'm just giving God the glory. I mean, now my car, uh, if I, I can't remember the last time I, <laughs> I know how much I bought my cars. I think, uh, uh, where's my secretary again? How much was that car? <laughs> Emoji. <laughs> Conversions need to take over. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Watch it. Amen. So there's a fight. And you know, we all have that tendency. We all have that tendency to boast about material possession. We all have it. I have it. You have it. But you must stay in the fight. Hallelujah. And keep your sermons away from such things. Who's following what I'm saying this afternoon? Luke 21. Stay in the fight. Luke 21. Praise God. I said, praise the Lord. Luke 21, 34. Let's take it again. Come on. Let's say Luke 21, 34. Let's go. Take heed to yourselves. Lest at any time your heart be overcharged with sufficing and drunkenness and cares of life. So that day comes upon you on our ways. You are no longer conscious of eternal things. You are now overtaking the cares of life. I, you won't get married, have kids, travel out, build houses. They are legitimate desires. But don't be overcome by them. So that when they don't come on time, or when they don't come at all, you don't lose sight of eternal things. Is that clear? Take heed. So take heed of the leaven of the Pharisees. Take heed of covetousness. Take heed of your own desires and the cares of this life. Take heed. They are not sinful cares. It's just that if it overwhelms you, it drives away legitimate things that are in Christ. Take heed also to the flock. Acts 20:28. 20, Take it to the flock. Apparently, Paul was saying what Jesus said to Peter. Lovest thou me more than this? Three times he turned to him. He said, care for my flock. Feed them. John 21, verse 15, verse 17, and verse 18. And Paul now says to the leaders of Ephesus, take heed to the flock. I tell this to our leaders in church. If you are not ready to care for people, don't take up the responsibility to pastor them. Because being a pastor does not immune you from your own challenges. But if you are too immature, so that when you have your own challenges, that's the only thing you will be facing. Don't take up the ministry. The ministry means that that's your own need becomes secondary. That's what it is. So if you are not mature, that's why Paul says it's more, it mustn't be given to a novice. It mustn't be given to a novice. Why would Paul stand before Festus and Agrippa and here he is, he's in chains. And he says to them, say, how are you Paul? He said, I'm a happy man. Happy man. And right there, he begins, he said, I wish that you are just like as I am. That is conviction. So, hear me. Take heed to the flock. Don't become someone that someone, I mean, I know churches can get very large. And some of us are fellowship leaders, cell leaders. Someone is no longer coming and you are not bothered. You don't even know. Take heed. Someone's Christian life is not stable again. You are not, you are not looking at the person. You are collecting his offering. So he seeds and you become a seed, a soul. And you have forgotten his spiritual life. Take heed to the flock. Say, feed the church, the flock of God, which he purchased with the blood of his own. So take heed, the leaven of the Pharisees, take heed, covetousness, take heed for your own desires, take heed to the flock. 
I used to help with this. If you abandon God's flock to face your own things, he will not give you anything to do again till you go back there. Get that right. Faithful. It is required in stewards that a man be faithful. You have to be faithful. Faithful. Does it mean I cannot go and do something else? No, no, I didn't say that. But don't abandon. The way you hand over things because you care for things, that is the way you ought to do things. Don't abandon the flock. Don't do it. So, pay attention. You take it to the flock. You also take it to yourself. Watch yourself. Have you discovered now that you spend more time in television than before? You know, people always go to the extremes. There will be a time some people will not watch television at all. They will just be praying and fasting. Then by the time you see how they dress, you say, ah, you have to stop praying and fasting. And how do you, so you say, you know what? Try and be watching, watch Arsenal games. Amen. Stay away from Chelsea games. Because the Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, wearing in excess. And I promised myself this year I wasn't going to go out. I'm so sorry. I don't know. It just happened. I'm not really sorry. Anyway, so, you know, then they now say, hey, that is it. Like some folks who hear, well, take care of yourself in the natural. You say, but you have a headache. Have you prayed? No, sir, but since you said that we should in the natural, they've gone to the other extreme. So, yes, as a younger Christian, you stayed off secular music totally because you wanted to make heaven. When you hear, uh, uh, you know Running Man? You know Running Man? Or Crazy Legs? I used to dance that. See? That's Bobby Brown. Uh, what's that song? Don't be crave. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> So when you see it like this, you go like this. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. <laughs> then they say, calm down now. Then they say, hey, there's nothing wrong. Ah, hallelujah. <laughs> in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. Ah, you have crossed over. <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> Take heed to yourself. Hallelujah. How many hours now on television? How many hours? You should restrict what you watch. That is the Christian life. Is that clear? Know the number of hours you spend on those secondary things. Take it to yourself. First Timothy 4, 16. Take heed to your doctrine. Take it to what you teach. How many times you review your sermons? Pastor, you check it again. Am I saying the right thing? Sometimes, you know, I said something that you don't, there's no scripture to command angels. Some guys went crazy. And one small boy said he has experiences with me. <laughs> Allah <Allow> Akbar. <laughs> me. I will tell you testimonies that are not hundred. But the point is that were that had seen before you were either born or born again. That's not the point. The first time I opened a blind eye, it was the use of anointing oil. The first time. So experiences are not scripture. I can roll out testimonies of speaking in tongues and confession and demonic came. Today I look at myself with tongues. I've been able to redefine all my experiences in the light of scriptures. Myself, a small boy, so he has experiences with who? I have series. What you are saying, I know it far better than you. No, it's even an, so I can ex, I can see if I handle error for you now, you will believe it. I'm dumb. <laughs> I know what I'm saying. Though. If I handle it for you, but we have not so learned Christ. The moment you see the light, you abandon what you were saying before. There's no point. 
That's why in one of the chapters in that book, what if it works? It's not a proof that you continue in something. Jesus was not the only one doing miracles in his day. He was not the only one. There were other people. Just like you saw in Samaria, there was Simon the sorcerer. He held a whole city spellbound. A.D. The whole city was following him. So relax. Sometimes, because of your environment, and we're in Africa, where people like signs and wonders a lot in Africa. You don't have to be born again in Africa to like signs and wonders. Though. If you're not careful, you will, re, you will incorporate that habit in your church. Are you following what I'm saying? Take it to yourself. Look at your teaching. Check it. And the most difficult are the ones that people have already told you, ah, sir, we're a blessing. I've never seen the Bible like that before. And then you see that both of you have never seen it before. <laughs> <laughs> but you owe Jesus Christ an allegiance. Hallelujah. Take heed to yourself. Take heed to your doctrine. This requires a fight. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5. We walk in the flesh. We do not walk after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. Hallelujah. To the pulling down stronghold, that is the preaching of the gospel, is not the carnal work. So there's a warfare. There's a warfare. To stay faithful is a fight. It's a fight. There are adversaries in the gospel. There are things that will stand against what you are saying. Sometimes what is popular will stand against what you are saying. In Hebrews 12, 1, he says, Seeing that we have so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race that is set before us with patience. Laying aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily be set. Now, the word run with patience there, in the Greek, it is conflict. There is a conflict. And it has to do with your attention span. Where you rather than looking on Christ, you look at other things. He said you must stay in line with the will of God by conflict. So obeying God requires conflict. There will be conflicting desires, conflicting opinions. In 1 Timothy 6.12, Paul says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. What's he talking about? Stay with the truth. Fight the good fight of faith. In 2 Timothy 4.7, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. It's a fight. Some say it's a fight. A fight against different enemies of obeying the Lord. Doctrines, desires, Popularity, populism, you stay in the fight. Imagine you need a lot of money and somebody writes you and then says to you, come and preach for us, sir. You need money. And then someone writes you, he says, sir, people, people like you, you know, Pastor Chris, can you help us raise 18 million? He said that to me. He said, we'll give you 6 million. And I said, let me say this once and make sure it's eternal in your mind. Don't call my number again. If you see this number and I call, it's a mistake. Don't pick it. Say, ah, no, no, okay, don't worry, sir. Don't raise the money again. I said, did you hear what I said the last time? Don't you think I needed the money? I did do. But stay in the fight. You do hear me? Stay in the fight. Stay in the fight. Stay there. I fought the good fight. Stay in the fight. To maintain a New Testament ministry, it takes a fight. Jude 3 says, contain earnestly for the faith that was delivered once and for all to us. There are four things I teach people about the gospel. Number one, you must believe the gospel. Number two, you must know the gospel. Number three, you must preach the gospel. Actually five. Number four, you must protect the gospel. So you believe it, Mark 16, 15 to 17. 
You know it, all the Pauline prayers, so that you know the gospel. Your eyes understand being enlightened, you know it. Then you preach it. You believe it, then you preach it. 2 Corinthians 5.18. We have the ministry of reconciliation, 5.19. We have the ministry of reconciliation. And then you now protect it. Look at the two apostolic letters. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. It was to protect it. Jude did the same thing. Many of the letters Paul wrote at the last days of his life was so that the message be protected. So you believe it, you know it, you preach it, and you also protect it. You must fight to ensure that your desires do not overwhelm you. How do you do this as we close Believers Convention 2018? Remain full of the word all the time. Don't be full of sermons. Be full of the word. If you are full of sermons and not the word, you'll be like someone who makes food for others but doesn't eat in it. Be full of the word yourself. Make sure what you are preaching, you are practicing it as well. You must be a doer of the word as well. James 1, 21. It says, laying aside all fieldness as perfect, nothingness, receive with meekness, the engrafted word which is able to save the soul. He said, be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, acrotis in the Greek, he is like a man who beholds his natural face in the mirror. Straight away go at his way, forget the manner of man he was. Don't be that kind of person. Feed on the word. Be full of the word. Be full of the Holy Ghost. So that you are not just full of the Holy Ghost in service. You are full of the Holy Ghost. You are led of the Holy Ghost. You are full of the word. You have your, what we call, morning devotion. It has not expired. Hallelujah. Do you hear me? Have your morning devotion. Be full of the word. Be full of the Holy Ghost. Be full of prayer. Be full of prayer. Prayer above other things keeps us in the center of God's will. I write this as we close. Don't get tired of reaching more men. Never get weary. Keep the fire and keep the flame. Don't ever get tired of reaching more men. Are you 1,000 in your church? Are you 100? Are you 20? Keep reaching out. Keep reaching men. Keep having time for men. Keep talking to men. Keep teaching men. Keep praying for them. Keep building men. Never get weary. Stay in the fight. Don't give up on your church. Don't give up on your ministry. Don't give up on your fellowship. Don't give up on it. Stay there. Remember I said, those who give up, don't obey God. Because obeying God takes a fight. A fight against your desires, influences. A fight against your attention being divided. Don't give up. Stay in the fight. Hallelujah. As we close this convention, I want us to sing a song. Isaiah, sing the song for us. So will I. Amen. Where is he? Praise the Lord. I think you need a sound on your keyboard, right? Where is he? As we leave this convention, don't forget to stay in the fight. Tell the person beside you, stay in the fight. Don't give up. Stay in the fight. Stay with your conviction. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life.
to worship so alive I can see your heart in everything you've made Every burning star or signal fire of
every precious one the child would you die to save if you gave your life to love them so Lift your hands and just worship Him. 